Global cities are becoming more and more multilingual. They attract people from different places and those people bring their languages along with them. And in today's world there are so many opportunities for mobility, for communication, people can keep in touch with one another. There's also an acceptance of multiple identities and so people can hold on to their heritage languages while also learning the language of the majority population as well as quite often the languages of their neighbors of different backgrounds. And so for all of these reasons cities are becoming more multilingual and they're also staying multilingual. As a university we can help raise awareness of languages, um, among other things, by developing tools to document languages, especially lesser known languages. And we can share those language resources both with specialist linguists and with the general public. Uh, I've been interested in my uh, own um, uh, dialect, you know, my own language, Kurdish, uh, Kurmanji. I'm from uh, Khamishli originally. I'm a Mustayar on Chekiri, who has a lot of people who are in the same way. I'm a Mustayar on Chekiri, who has a lot of people who are in the same way. I'm a Mustayar on Chekiri, who has a lot of people who are in the same way. I'm a Mustayar on ولات اندین زی کو لسر زمان کردی تشتک نزانم. And I've just said a few words about how we and why we decided to set up um, this online archive of Kurdish dialects of Kurdish language, and that it contains not just recordings of different dialects from different villages and towns to show the uh, um, the, the richness of, of Kurdish speech and Kurdish culture. Um, but also the voices of people that we've recorded, they tell stories, they tell traditional tales, and they tell about themselves, about their own lives, about the lives of villages, about customs. And so we've created an archive not just of speech, but also of Kurdish culture. So we'd like to give you a short demonstration of just um, some of the samples. <laughs> Multilingual Manchester is a way of trying out a new concept of how the university can interact with and engage with the city and with its um, communities. Uh, you might say that we are rethinking the university. We take inspiration from looking at the city and its communities and seeing what is of concern to them and what is important to them. And we also seek inspiration from our students, from the experiences that they bring in and from the questions that they ask. We are going to be doing an art project and your artwork is going to be going up in the train station permanently. 
We were really pleased to be invited to take part in this project by Community Rail Lancashire. For us uh, at Multilingual Manchester, it fits perfectly with our public engagement activities around languages and language diversity. Because through the language activities that we designed, we're hoping to encourage the pupils to share their language skills and to find out more about the languages spoken in the area. What we're going to do, the artwork that you're going to make, we would like to have some languages and some words on this artwork. So we want words in English. It might be that you might know some of these words in other languages as well. So maybe you know them in French or Urdu or Chinese or Arabic, okay? What I've experienced over the years, I've been working for more than 20 years now, that children who are uh, put in an environment where they feel they belong to a certain culture or to the language that the parents speak, they feel more secure in a way to be able to face outside their house. Noon Fatha? No. Noon Dhamma? No. Noon Kasra? No. Noon Alif? No. Wardrobe. Do you remember wardrobe? Ward, ward, wardrobes. Wardrobes? Okay, and then this bit's just... Your furniture inside. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Because the temporal house, I have four... Four furnished. Four furnished. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know it's difficult to pronounce this. Uh, it's furnished. 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 Yeah, furnished. Furnished. Okay, thank you. Furnished. Yeah. This is this one is called tenancy contract. Uh, this is very important to have when you are a new landlord or landlady because it keeps your rights and at the same time it keeps the landlord's rights. Sign here, that's it. So it's very simple. The landlord's just giving me the contracts then and said, okay, can you sign this? Right. Yeah. I need to have a confidence to talk, you know, speak English. Uh, so when I come in this uh, session, I know the person I speak to, uh, he or she knows I am the learner. So 
I speak better than if I want to speak in the public or some office. You know, I have some anxiety and stress. So, but here I know, you know, I'm I'm a learner. So, I feel more confident to speak English in in this session than outside. If I have a confidence here, it's helped me to in future to speak, you know, confidently. I think Manchester is a very unique uh, city in this country. Uh, it's because of the uh, uh, different people from different uh, countries living in this country. And the, the impression that I used to have when I was in my home country that it will be difficult to communicate with other people from different cultural backgrounds and different uh, languages. Uh, but I found the opposite here actually. I didn't find the communication breakdown because of the different cultures. Very every week. Here, furnished. Furnished. Ah, yo. Yeah. Furnished. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. People try to, to merge in this country, in this language, on this culture, and try to understand each other and respect their uh, privacies and their uh, legacies. So I find this uh, very interesting and it's very uh, much embodied in these uh, sessions. Few people with responsibility for frontline services, I think, will deny that knowledge about language and or languages and access to a pool of people with knowledge of languages is essential in order to run a major city these days. And, and few people in the frontline services and uh, businesses, I think, will deny that such knowledge is also needed in order to effectively reach out to the world. Last week, I went with two of my colleagues to a meeting at Greater Manchester Police Headquarters. And we met with a team of uh, managers and senior officers who want to improve the police force's communications with Manchester's diverse population groups. And they're interested in a whole range of questions which they would like us to address. They want to know, for example, which languages are spoken in Manchester, in Greater Manchester, and where. And they want to gain a better understanding of what is the difference between languages and dialects. And they want to know which languages are what they call rare languages, and with that they mean languages that are more difficult to find an interpreter for. They want to know more about which speakers of which languages are likely to be bilingual, and in which other languages, and uh, which languages might lack terms such as domestic violence or hate crime, and how to convey such concepts to speakers of such languages. So the questions that they ask fall under various different research headings, all of which are somehow connected to research and the study of modern languages. So all of this expertise in a whole variety of specialized domains is required by a key public service provider in order to effectively engage with its clients in the global city of today. And this is a city where the overwhelming majority of the population speaks what last week the Prime Minister referred to as the language of the world. When we think about the public discourse around languages, language use in the city, it's very common to talk about the language deficit, what people don't know, how, how you know, unproficient people are uh, in English, rather than thinking about the many positive benefits uh, of multilingualism. These sort of remain hidden uh, in the background, one might say. Of course, limited language proficiency uh, is a very practical problem uh, for many people and institutions in the management of day-to-day -day, um, interactions. And this is why we need professional uh, translation and interpreting services. Like you mentioned about jumping, and I think there was a very classic example in our team once upon a time, and an interpreter mentioned it's raining cats and dogs. Yeah. And he went out, they said, no, it's not, it's just water. <laughs> <coughs> so that kind of thing, we don't have to use idioms. Mm. Yeah. Simple, plain, and very clear English, and loud, as, as loud as me, kind of. <coughs> 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 
agree. Um, with the dialects and accents, like the Sudanese, um, the Arabic language, you have the special Sudanese accent. If the service user doesn't understand that special Sudanese, um, Sudanese accent of the interpreter, the whole essence of getting that interpreter over is um, ruined. You have to start all over again. Um, we're, we're really keen to get the message out to families that bilingualism doesn't cause delay, it doesn't cause speech and language difficulties, and bilang bi bilingualism is an advantage, like we've said, there's so many advantages to education, cognition, social, economic. Tens of thousands of children attending various supplementary schools on a regular basis, every week, um, and uh, we cost the public just uh, virtually nothing. We are mainly self-supported, uh, obviously with other support like uh, um, DBS checking, that kind of thing, from city council, and now from uh, um, Yaron's this um, um, supplementary school uh, support uh, platform. One of the challenges that we face I, I is we how to support uh, the city and like sometimes fill gaps without becoming service deliverers and without creating a relationship of dependency on our contribution, and indeed without taking anything away from the work of agencies and organizations whose main job it is to provide services. Another challenge is how to inspire stakeholders in the city to embrace a new vision of language diversity without becoming lobbyists or advocates for an idea uh, and thereby straying away from our main role, which is to be researchers and teachers. Everybody, uh, today is a multilingual day. This stall is for Manchester Deaf Centre. So our aim is to raise awareness for BFL but it's a recognisable language. It's, it's just to teach BSL and, and introductory signs to people. So for example, hello, thank you, how are you, where are you from, what is your name, just simple things. Yeah, I have this one. Ah, ah, yeah, ah. you are right. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Welcome everyone and good morning. It is our great pleasure to welcome you today to the University of Manchester to celebrate the first 
successful year of Manchester Arabic School. We are very excited and feel very proud to be able to accompany you on this journey and we'll continue to do everything we can to support you as a university. وباسم الجامعة أريد أن أشكركم على جهودكم على عملكم وعلى الصمودكم وأتمنى لكم الاستمرار والنجاح وشكرا أولى نجيب عادل يسرى الفاروقي نور رايس آدم برايس Manchester is one of the most linguistically diverse cities uh, in the country uh, and we're really proud of that diversity, that linguistic diversity. We're really keen on making sure that we have a strategy around languages and I am working with Professor Matras uh, from the university in developing a strategy that truly recognises that Manchester has this rich diversity in its language but also has a strategy in terms of what we do and how we preserve and how we support supplementary schools and language schools and how we support people. We've embarked on a, a very exciting project. We want to create a poem called Made in Manchester with as, me with as many languages as possible in it. So far, we have over 50 languages in that poem. The target is to get about 100 languages into that poem. People were so um, amazed that they were allowed the platform to share something not only in English but that, that Manchester City Council was so eager to engage with them and know about their backgrounds because through talking to people about like, giving in their lines and submitting their poem entries they, they would be so amazed that they're allowed to submit something in their native language and that someone was going to take this into account as something that counts as the, the tapestry of Manchester. A few years ago we set out as a research project to uh, try and take an inventory of the languages that are spoken in Manchester and see which languages and how many are spoken in the city. Now it's very difficult to put an exact number on the languages that are spoken in the city, but we came to the conclusion that uh, Manchester is a city with a very high language diversity for its population size and that there are anywhere around 200 languages spoken in the city. And that was reported at the time in the media as well. But after the arena bombing in Manchester in uh, 2017, attention was uh, drawn again to the city's language diversity uh, in the press when the press was talking about the city's resilience and this very moving reaction uh, that city initiatives had to celebrate diversity and togetherness and cohesion uh, after the shock of the arena bombing. And since then, this phrase, city of 200 languages, has become a kind of an emblem. And it is very moving because it's a way uh, for the city and its residents to say, we celebrate diversity, we celebrate togetherness, we take pride in the language and culture diversity that we have in the city. For us as a university, it's a way of using language as a way to access the city and the city's identity as it is evolving. <laughs> 